Good morning. This is Doug Bend with Bend Law Group. We're excited for everyone to be joining us this morning for our presentation on legal funding tools for early stage startups. I thought we would uh, get started by telling you a little bit about um, myself, my background, uh, the background of the law firm, and then we'll jump into presenting about verbal promissory notes, state documents, and Series A rounds. Please feel free to submit your questions during the presentation. We'll be answering the questions at the end of the presentation uh, as time allows. So a little bit about myself is that I grew up of all places in Nebraska. I've been practicing law now since 2006. We founded the Ben Law Group back in 2010, uh, focusing exclusively on advising small business owners and entrepreneurs. We don't do any sort of litigation. We purely help people out with transactional matters, including raising rounds of capital. A few other things that we, we focus on is we help set up over 50 new companies a year. We serve as their outside general counsel, and we do a lot of contracts, drafting, and negotiating for our clients. And as, as I mentioned before, raising uh, capital, often starting with uh, uh, the seed round. So I'm going to do uh, convertible promissory notes and safe documents, and then I'm going to hand the baton over to Brendan Shelton, who's also with the Ben Law Group, who will cover Series C documents and Series A price rounds, and some of the important things to keep in mind about having accredited investors in the investment round, and also some things uh, when thinking about different securities filings that you have to file with uh, a seed round. So the first item we're discussing is convertible promissory notes. Uh, you know, convertible promissory notes are still the, the tool that most startups use when raising their seed round of capital. Uh, over time, if you think about in terms of a gas gauge, fewer and fewer deals are being used. Uh, convertible promissory notes is still a majority of deals at the seed round use convertible promissory notes. And so what is a convertible promissory note? A convertible promissory note essentially is, is a promissory note that also has the upside uh, to convert into equity down the road. And so we, we see a lot of startups use convertible promissory notes really for a few different reasons. The first reason is that it's what investors expect to see. So a lot of investors, especially if they've been doing uh, startup investing for a long time, they're used to convertible promissory notes. Uh, they know how they work. They know key terms of the notes. They know what to look for. So it's a real comfort blanket for investors that do a lot of early stage investing that a lot of them would uh, prefer to use a convertible promissory um, note over uh, the state document. And the other reason is because they're used so often is that you can often do a speed round uh, fairly quickly with the, you know spending a, not as much money on uh, legal documents as using a price fix round that, that Brandon will talk about later. And I think one of the biggest questions we get from our clients is that, well, why do we need to use convertible promissory notes at all? Why can't I just sell you know 20% of the stock in my company for uh, $200,000, for example, for raising uh, money early on for a, a startup. And a lot of it is that it really deals with the valuation of the company and the fair market value of the company's stock. And so the reason we use convertible promissory notes is that if you were to instead nearly sell stock in the company to someone for $200,000 in exchange for, let's say, 10% of the company, well, in the eyes of the IRS, you have then, you then at that point in time put a valuation on the company of two million dollars. You know, if you're selling two hundred thousand, uh, ten percent of the company for two hundred thousand dollars, if there's ever an audit, the IRS will come in and say, "Hey, look, that was a new high water mark for the fair market value of the company. The company's worth two million dollars." And really, the problem with that is that it makes it much more difficult to utilize uh, stock to incentivize advisors and employees to come uh, down the road to the company. Because they either have to pay the same amount per share that the investor paid per share, or they're supposed to recognize as taxable income the difference between what they paid for the stock and what the investor paid for the stock. And so we have these tools, convertible promissory notes, safe documents, that really kick the can down the road for when the investors are actually buying shares in the company to keep the fair market value of the shares low. So, so you can be able to issue those shares to employees and to advisors at a very low value, often the par value, uh, to be able to utilize them uh, as a tool for onboarding uh, key employees and key advisors. So that's why, you know, we use convertible promissory notes. That's why we use safe documents uh, instead of just merely selling shares to an investor at the seed round. 
So as I mentioned, you know, the verbal promissory notes, that that's still the predominant tool that most uh, that's most often used when raising capital for a startup. Uh, you know, in the last few years, uh, Y Combinator, YC, has put out SAFE documents. It stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity is an alternative to convertible promissory note. We've seen it increase in popularity year over year. More and more people become familiar with safe documents that are comfortable using safe documents. Uh, and so we see more and more deals done using safe documents. And really the, the safe document was intended by the Y Combinator to address what they perceive to be some of the problems with convertible promissory notes. And really that the biggest item is that with a convertible promissory note, it's a debt instrument. And in the convertible promissory note, it's a loan that you're making to the company that has the opportunity to convert into equity. That loan has a maturity date. It's often two years in advance uh, from when the convertible promissory note is signed. And so from the perspective of the startup, having that maturity date come due, is technically a, a debt on the books of the company. And if they don't pay off that debt after the maturity date matures, or if it hasn't converted into equity, well, you know, they're in default of that loan to the company. And so unlike the verbal promissory notes, safe documents don't have a maturity date. And so there's not that kind of looming deadline that you have with the verbal promissory notes with safe documents. Now, of course, from the, the perspective of the investors, a lot of investors, uh, you know, still prefer the verbal promissory, promissory notes, not only because it's what they're used to, but they also like having that deadline. They like having that maturity date in the convertible promissory note. They like knowing that if the note is not converted after two years, that you know they can have a discussion with the company about uh, perhaps uh, you know getting a concession or two in exchange for extending that convertible promissory note. So when we're often advising startup clients, uh, we often recommend the safe documents because we feel that they might be more advantageous from the perspective of the startup. Whereas if we're representing an investor, we often will ask for a convertible promissory note because we like having that deadline, that maturity date that's in the convertible promissory note that you don't find in the safe document. So I'm going to uh, kind of pass the torch here over here in a, in a, in a minute to, to Brandon. I think really one thing I wanted to touch about briefly before I do that, though, is, you know, what are some of the, the key terms that we see um, – you know, in uh, convertible promissory notes, in safe documents, what, what do we see that's negotiated in those documents? And really, uh, one of the nice things about both sets of documents is that you're not, uh, you're not negotiating a lot of items. They're very simple documents. They're intended to have rounds that are completed in a time-efficient manner. So these startups that are raising capital can use more of the capital on uh, improving the product of the company and, and not on attorney fees. But really, the, the two items that we see that are most you know, heavily discussed uh, in convertible promissory notes and, and in safe documents is first, it's called a discount rate. And essentially, a discount rate is a, an incentive to the seed round investors for getting in early with the company. And so the way that it works is that when the uh, safe document converts, when the convertible promissory note converts, those early stage investors, they not only get the same terms as, they, as the Series A round investor, they get a discount. And it's often the, the, the amount that we see most often is a 20% discount, is an incentive to incentivize them for ha having gotten in early on with the company. Uh, so we sometimes see that negotiated, but we'd, see, we'd say probably the vast majority of the deals, at least 90, 95% of the deals, uh, use the 20% discount rate both for the safe document and the convertible promissory note. And then the other item is a valuation cap. And, you know, essentially the valuation cap, I call that the Instagram provision. And the idea being that, you know, if you invested early on in Instagram and in the seed round and you put $25,000 into the seed round, that it blew up so much in terms of valuation that if there wasn't a valuation cap on that investment, you would still have a very, very small percentage of the company because the valuation is so high the next round. So even though you're getting a, a 20% discount if the valuation is, is off the charts the next round, even with that discount, you're not looking at a meaningful equity stake in the company. So instead, you know, savvy investors will often negotiate a valuation cap um, at the next round in terms of what their equity converts at. And the range that we see on the valuation cap really varies. And it really varies really on two different things. One, first, you know, what type of company is it? Is it really a company that's looking to grow and scale that, uh, that can quickly uh, bring on new users, new customers, uh, you know, that type of startup, then the valuation tends to be higher because those are the type of companies that uh, savvy uh, 
you know, startup investors like to see. And secondarily, what is the pedigree of the founders? You know, if they, the, the founders have had one or two exits in the past, if they if they have, um, you know, they went to Harvard and Stanford, they went to Y Combinator, they have a type of uh, information shortcuts that some investors look at for fees that a, a company may be more successful, that type of founder may be able to, to push for a higher valuation cap than the founder that may be on their first company, uh, maybe doesn't have that type of pedigree, that type of background. And so the investment uh, perhaps is a is a more risk, risky investment for them. And so these tend to be the two terms that we see uh, investors negotiate uh, the most on. There's some other items, but these tend to be the two heavy, heaviest that are negotiated. And we tend to see in terms of what's most typical, 20% for the discount rate between 3 to $9 million on the valuation cap, depending on uh, the background of the founder and kind of like the key, the key idea of the company. Uh, so with that, I'm going to you know, hand the presentation over to Brandon, who's going to focus on the, the, uh, the other items for raising a, uh, a seed round and capital for an uh, early stage uh, startup. All right, uh, this is Brandon. I uh, just wanted to thank everybody as well for uh, being here for this presentation. Um, as the slide shows, you know, I was born in Milwaukee, so I'm a huge Packers fan, but I grew up in the East Bay. I moved out to California when I was around, when I was seven years old. Um, so I mostly consider myself Californian, but, uh, you know, there's still some roots tied there. I um, went to college at uh, UC Santa Barbara, so if there are any gouches out there, awesome. Um, I majored in dramatic arts, uh, even though uh, prior to um, going to college, I was in the military and I was a computer programmer. So I'm kind of, kind of a renaissance person, kind of all over the place. But you know, that's how, uh, I guess that's the millennial in me. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so uh, after that, I directed a lot of plays and I was interning with independent filmmakers. And throughout that process, um, I was encouraged by some filmmakers to go to law school. Um, went to law school at UC Davis. And uh, after that, you know, based on some of my computer programming background, I started as a patent litigation uh, associate and then I uh, was uh, rerouted to the transactional side of things, um, especially, you know, in the tech field. It happens to be a lot of our clients are, are in that arena. Um, I joined Ben Law Group. Uh, actually, I just hit my one year mark. And so, um, but overall I've been doing corporate transactions for about four years now. So um, with that said, I will get to my part of the presentation and I may have to flip through a few slides here. So uh, give me just a moment. Okay. So uh, if you haven't really taken a look at how companies that are in early stages receive uh, cash for actual equity and shares in a company. Um, just a brief overview, a priced round is basically a funding round consisting of shares of stock in a company. Um, however, in order to be able to sell those shares of stock and have a little more flexibility in price preferences and uh, rights associated with that ownership, uh, you have to be basically create an additional class of shares. So most often when you're trading on, you know, something, if you buy shares on the New York Stock Exchange, the high likelihood is that you'll be buying common stock of some, you know, company like you know, McDonald's, for example. But uh, in these earlier stage companies, uh, there's a lot more flexibility when, you know, the company is just getting off the ground. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, um, in a price round, you'll have to actually amend the articles or certificate of incorporation, depending on the state that you're in, um, to allow for uh, additional classes of shares. So some people uh, very early on will create a series seed, which is typically um, consisting of uh, friends and family and angel investors. And other, uh, other people will also uh, you know, more sophisticated investors will expect to see like Series A, Series B, and Series C uh, financing rounds where they have a lot more uh, say and control over the business's operations. Um, this is... Okay, so 
sorry, there's a little bit of a mix here. Um, so in pre-funding considerations, and by that I mean prior to actually even, even selling shares to anybody, you, you really need to identify who your investors are. That's a pretty important uh, task to complete before you actually issue any shares. Um, basically, the SEC has uh, securities reg uh, registration rules. Um, the rule is that you're expected to register any securities in a company that you sell to anybody. So uh, at, at first glance, that seems a little bit onerous, and it would be. However, uh, Regulation D allows you to apply for or notify this, the SEC of a reliance upon certain exemptions. So one of those main exemptions is Rule 506 B, which allows you to um, issue to in an unlimited number of accredited investors and 35 uh, unaccredited investors. So what is an, an accredited investor? An accredited investor is somebody with individual income of $200,000 per year or combined income of $300,000 per year with their spouse for at least two years. Um, that's that's one example. Another is a person who has a net worth of $1 million in liquid assets, meaning they have a very big bank account that they can give you some money from. Um, and the ex expectation is that with these high net worth individuals or these people with high income, they're savvy enough to be able to identify and properly uh, evaluate companies that are uh, high risk, high reward companies. Um, other individuals that can be... Uh, classified as accredited investors are general partners, executive officers, or directors of the issuer, meaning the company that you are working at. Um, there also have been recent changes to the rules that allow for uh, stockbrokers and investment advisors to be considered uh, accredited investors. Um, and also, if somebody is investing out of their own company, if that company is valued at $5 million or, or higher, then they also can be considered an accredited investors. And you'll you'll mostly, if not exclusively, want to choose accredited investors as your investors in your company because of the fact that if you do not, you'll actually have to provide a, 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 a audited financials from your company so that people can have enough information if they're not as savvy with, with business. So, you know, in a series seed round where there's sometimes – you know, friends and family providing a lot of your investment, uh, you'll have to issue them some more expensive financial information out of your company. So um, if you really, really want to avoid that cost, you should really be reaching out to people who have already established themselves in the business world, whether in your field or other fields, so that they are more savvy. You don't have to deliver them as much information. Um, you also have to make yourself available to um, – have any conversations with your unaccredited investors. So there is also that, you know, man hour time, uh, uh, time commitments that you'll have to make to those individuals who are not accredited investors. And as I mentioned before, you can only have 35 in each round. So if there are more than 35 people, you need more than 35 people who are unaccredited investors. Uh, you, you probably need to uh, narrow that uh, because there are limitations on, on those numbers. Uh, went over this already. Uh, so a series seed round, we'll focus on that exclusively right now. And as I mentioned, um, a series seed round is very usually very early in the life of the company. Um, it typically consists of friends, family, and some in, uh, angel investors. Uh, but as I said, there are added costs to that. So it may or may not be the choice that you want to make that early. Um, uh, Doug touched on the uh, convertible notes and the safe notes. And <clears throat> if uh, if you're considering issuing to friends and family, that might be the better route for them because they're simpler and they don't require as much information or, or work to provide them that information. So in the, uh, in the Series A preferred round, uh, this is something that typically comes later in the investing uh life cycle. Uh, usually you'll have been operating your company for a solid year or greater. Um, and at that point, you're probably looking to expand the uh, operations of your company. 
you know, if we're talking about a, a, an app development where we've probably developed a product or at least a prototype or, uh, or something that you can actually show to pre uh, properly sophisticated investors, you'll probably be putting together uh, financial information, um, you know, perspective information to provide to your investors, showing them what you expect, what you need to get from point A to point B, how you're going to bring your product to market, how you're going to uh, bring in actual revenue, when you'll be able to be, uh, you know, actually, you know, have positive revenue in the, in the company. Um, and likewise, you'll probably be talking to more sophisticated angel investors and venture capitalists. Angel investors uh, are people that are probably more well apprised of your, uh, your line of business and your, uh, and, and the things that you are actually trying to accomplish in the market, whereas venture capitalists are more generally just, uh, they have other people's money and they have to identify things in various markets um, that will basically ensure that their client's money is properly expanded and, uh, and the investments are good. And so typically they're looking for something that could either be you know, worth nothing or eventually will bring their clients uh, you know, 10 times uh, what they've actually invested. So venture capitalists are typically going to be more involved than angel investors, um, but both can be accredited investors, especially, um, you know, based on the criteria that we had, that I had brought up before. So um, the key terms that you're uh, going to need to negotiate with uh, angel investors and venture capitalists and some of your friends and family even. Uh, the key terms that you're going to need to um, negotiate with them are pricing, voting rights, board membership, liquidation preferences, and dividend preferences. And I'll go through each of these key terms uh, in a little more detail here. So, um, so pricing. When we're talking about pricing shares, typically um, you might say, well, why, how do we even do that? Um, and it's not always very, it's not always very specific. There's not like a set rule of how to price something. It can be subjective. Um, it can be relatively objective. Um, but the safest way to price any share is to actually hire a third party valuation company. Um, but some earlier stage companies just don't have the funds to be able to do that. So what they will do um, is uh, they will actually create a series seed or series A round where they have a lot more subjective flexibility to be able to price the, the shares. Um, and the IRS has typically shown themselves to be a little more forgiving on that subjectivity due to the fact that there are different rights and preferences associated with those preferred shares. Um, so a lot of times we'll have clients come into us and say, you know, I want to issue shares to my investors at a $10 million valuation and I want to issue, I want to raise $500,000. So what they're really saying is we need to create a price round where we set the value of the company at $10 million and then we, uh, set the share price at whatever that equates to based on the number of shares they've authorized. And then we'll ultimately have to go and amend the certificate of incorporation or articles of incorporation to allow for that number of shares that they want to issue. Um, just uh, a caution though, the pricing still must be based on market realities and business judgment. Uh, and what that means is uh, generally companies are required to, or at least the board of directors is required to use their business judgment in making decisions that are in the interest of the company. So, when you're when you're making when you're setting a price for this particular round, uh, it can't just be pulled out of thin air. You have to be able to say, you know, since I've been working in this field for X amount of years, and we've seen how other companies have performed and what other companies have raised. I think our company is valued at this amount based on my experience and expertise in this field. So by that, I mean, if it's completely divorced from reality and it's based on something that's simply just not, uh, 
the actual market realities of your companies. Um, and in some case, in the worst case scenario where it's almost targeted dilution or something that you're doing to sabotage the company, which obviously doesn't happen that much, but um, it is something that you have to be careful of. You just have to make sure that you're actually using your business judgment to set that price. Um, and like I said, as long as, as long as you're doing that, the IRS technically will be a little uh, more flexible and allow you to set that price a little more subjectively than they would if you were not, uh, if you were just issuing ordinary shares. So the second term that is really uh, kind of important to uh, negotiate is voting rights. Um, voting rights typically are set on an as converted basis. And what an as converted basis is, is it's based on the ratio of voting rights that would exist if the preferred shares were converted to common stock. Um, this is kind of an important point because when you actually set a, <clears throat> excuse me, when you set aside, uh, when you create a new class of shares, such as the Series A round, Series B, or even Series C, and not C, <laughs> um, when you when you set aside those shares, you actually uh, they will typically have like a right of conversion later on. For example, if and when the company goes public. And so those people will ultimately then be granted common stock based on some conversion ratio. And many uh, different companies have different ways of calculating that ratio. The simple is just to say that a Series A share is worth one uh, share of common stock, but there are other ways of actual conversion. So um, when we say on an as converted basis, that means that if the Series A stock was converted to common stock on a one-to-one -one ratio, that means you get one vote per share of Series A preferred stock. And, and that would be along the same lines of the common stock share voting rights. So if we're voting for board members and everybody gets to vote as one class, then everybody holding common stock would get one vote per, per share and every person holding series A stock would also get one vote per share. Um, voting rights also go down the road of a lot of other um, certain decisions that uh, are important to the company, such as mergers, acquisitions, um, uh, votes for cause for removing board members. There's a lot of different obviously uh, a lot of different voting rights that can be affected and can affect the direction and profitability of the company. And so what some Series A investors will require is that certain decisions will require additional approval by the preferred shareholders as a class. So for example, um, a lot of uh, companies will create a board that has preferred shareholders that are, or, or sorry, um, board members that are exclusive to uh, the preferred shareholders. So in other words, uh, as, an, uh, as an example, somebody might come in and provide investment during the Series A round, and they'll say, well, how can I protect my investment? What I would like is to have a guaranteed spot on the board to be able to affect decision making. And so what they'll do is they'll, in the articles, they'll guarantee them a Series A board member, and only the Series A shareholders get to vote on that board member. So they will always be in the position to be able to at least have some oversight and some control in the direction of the company. Um, they typically won't have a majority control in that way, but they do that so that they can at least have some insight and some control over their investment. So. Um, so you'll see that a lot, and uh, that's one way that voting can be kind of uh, adjusted to protect their investment. Um, also, uh, one way that voting can be adjusted is uh, you'll see a lot of people um, say, well, I want to issue a series seed round, but I don't want the individuals in the series seed to have any voting rights. I just want them to be able to have some other pre preferences to protect their investment other than voting. Um, and I say you can eliminate most voting rights because uh, a lot of uh, corporate law, if not all of it, protects at least some voting rights for uh, preferred shareholders. So as an example, in California Corporations Code Section 400A, it says that 
corporation may issue one or more series of shares or both with full, limited, or no voting rights and with other such rights, preferences, privileges, and restrictions as are stated or authorized in its articles. So again, that's basically saying that you can actually have no voting rights as long as you account for that in your articles. However, uh, California Corporations Code Section 117 states that um, any requirement in this division for a vote of each class of outstanding shares means such a vote regardless of limitations or restrictions upon the voting rights thereof. So what does that mean? That means that if there is something that affects a class or a series of your shareholders, they have to have a right to vote on it. So for example, um, let's say that in the Series A round, you provide a liquidation preference uh, that made them the highest priority liquidation preference. Then later on, you did a Series B round, and, and Series B said, no, we want the highest priority of liquidation preference. You would have to have your Series A investors vote on that because they would basically be taking a back seat to the Series B round. So uh, Section 117 guarantees them the right to vote regardless of the limitations or restrictions. So put another way, if it affects their money, you cannot require them to give up that voting right. However, you do actually have some workarounds to that. Um, this concludes module number one. Please proceed through the checkpoint to module number two and enjoy the remainder of your CLE.